Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I think there might be a few people still making their way through the slush, but we'll go ahead and get started so that we don't cut anything short. My name is Tom Ahern. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an epidemiologist in the surgery department here and uh, one of the project directors for the VCBH. And it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today for the first lecture series of uh, 2017, Dr. Jamie Gratis. Uh, Jamie is an epidemiologist in the Women's Health Sciences Division of the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder at the VA Medical Center in Boston. And because that's not a long enough affiliation, <laughs> she's also an assistant professor of psychiatry and epidemiology at Boston University. She received both her master's in public health and her doctor of science degrees in epidemiology from the Boston University School of Public Health and uh, currently has a research program studying the epidemiology of trauma and trauma-related disorders with a particular focus on suicide outcomes. She's received funding from the National Institute of Mental Health and from private foundations and has recently been awarded two R01s back-to-back, -back, first submission, uh, focused on risk modeling of trauma outcomes and suicidal behavior in the Danish population. Dr. Gratis was awarded the prestigious Lilienfeld Prize from the Society for Epidemiologic Research for her paper on the association between PTSD and death from suicide. And she's also a member of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, which is dedicated to sharing information about the effects of trauma and to disseminating knowledge about policy, program, and service initiatives aimed at reducing traumatic stressors and their health sequelae. So I'm delighted to have Dr. Gratis here today at UVM to share her work on improving uh, suicide prevention and understanding the psychopathology of trauma using uh, what you'll see are the very rich medical and social data resources of Denmark. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gratis to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was such a nice introduction. I can tell you there's probably zero chance I'm going to live up to it. So <laughs> lower your expectations. Now would be a good time to do that. But thank you. Thank you very much for having me and for all, to all of you for coming here today. Um, like Tom said, I'll be presenting some of my research on trauma and suicide in the population of Denmark. Um, and I appreciate you all being here. So a little bit about what we will talk about specifically today. I'm going to do a brief introduction to the Danish registry data. I realize a lot of people are probably not familiar um, with that resource. Thanks to Tom for the slides I'll be using that he gave me years ago um, that, that are very good. I still use them now. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the first study that I did as an investigator in Denmark uh, to establish a cohort of all people who had ICD-10 stress diagnoses over a 15-year time period. And I'll talk a little bit about who the members of that cohort are and some interesting things we found out about them, and then go over some of the work we've done on psychiatric, somatic, and mortality outcomes in that group. I'll also mention here that we also did actually a validation sub-study of the stress diagnoses and of the non-diagnosed comparison cohort as part of that project. I'm not going to talk about that today for the sake of time, um, but if anybody's interested in validation work or it's actually fascinating what you learn about your data in the course of a validation study, so I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit at the end if there's time or afterward. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the projects that I have currently underway in Denmark, the two R01s Tom mentioned that have just been both funded within the last 18 months. Um, one to look at sort of a follow-up to the stress cohort study where we're going to be looking at different classes of psychopathology following trauma and prediction of class membership and also um, a suicide prediction modeling study. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm using this instead of the mic. Okay. And then finally, um, conclude and take some questions. So let's start with an overview of the Danish data. So Denmark is a country of about 5.5 million people. There's a picture of it there. And Denmark has national health care, which is funded through taxes and cover 100% of the population. You can basically think of the Danish registry data as like a large billing system. A patient shows up to their doctor. They get diagnosed with something. That diagnosis gets sent to the government. The government pays for that care. Same thing goes for medications that are filled at the pharmacy, kind of any encounter people have with their medical providers. And registries have been ongoing in Denmark starting as early as the 17th century, beginning with actually church files and progressing through time towards the registries that we still use today, like the civil registration system down here, which was started in 1968. 
and then some of the prescription databases and national registries of sort of all diagnoses patients receive. And today there are over 200 specialized registries in Denmark covering vital statistics, medical information, employment information, residential information. Um, and the records from all of these different 200 registries can be linked together using something called a CPR number. And it's basically the Danish equivalent of a social security number. So each registry contains this for each person, and you use it as a linking ID. And it's sort of um, as simple as that. So my story with the Danish registries begins <laughs> back during my dissertation work. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to do my dissertation using the Danish registry data. And I produced some studies from that, which you'll see here. Um, and that really laid the groundwork for me to sort of be familiarized with the data, become integrated with the investigators there and the system there. Um, and after I graduated from school, as one does, I started to think of grants that I could submit. Um, and the first idea I had was to submit a study that would essentially create a registry of all people who had stress disorder diagnoses in Denmark. Um, and that then could be used to link to all sorts of outcomes, looking over time at what happens to people who receive these diagnoses. So that led to the Stress Cohort Project, which was um, my first independent grant in Denmark, funded via an R21. And so I'll be talking a little bit about that first. <clears throat> so as I said, the aims paraphrased here were to establish a cohort of people with incident ICD-10 stress disorder diagnoses from 1995 through 2011. And we basically said because it was an R21 mechanism and a short period of time and not that much money, we would just kind of look at some outcomes among people with the stress disorders. We would look at all-cause mortality, we would look at suicide, sort of as an initial demonstration of what could be done with the cohort once it was set up. And again, I'll say we had a validation study that was also part of this that I'm not going to be really covering today. So what are ICD-10 stress disorders? For anybody who doesn't know, it's a category of disorders um, that result from a significant stressful or traumatic experience from which one is having difficulty recovering. So there are some studies that show that actually after a traumatic event, pretty much everybody experiences symptoms that are consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder. But what typically happens in a natural recovery is that people, the symptoms will begin to abate over the months subsequent to the trauma. But for people where the symptoms do not abate, they end up ultimately getting diagnosed with PTSD or potentially, depending on the experience, one of the other disorders. So acute stress reaction is a diagnosis somebody receives in the immediate aftermath of a trauma. It's a little bit different than acute stress disorder for anyone who's familiar with that, which we have here in the US. This is the ICD version, which is sort of an initial reaction um, following a traumatic event within the 48 hours after it's occurring. Um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is probably the disorder for anyone who doesn't do psychiatry research that you might be the most familiar with, hearing about it on the news and things like that. Um, this is a disorder that someone would receive immediately in the months following a traumatic event um, and usually has pretty severe symptoms and sort of a long-term chronic trajectory. Adjustment disorders are a class of disorders that are um, diagnosed after a stressful event. So this is not the same as a trauma, in that a trauma is something in which someone typically would be fearful for their life or for somebody else's life. This is an event that um, is something that most of us deal with at some point during our lives, but for some reason somebody is having a hard time adjusting to the aftermath of the event. So something like a divorce or loss of a spouse, um, things like that. So something we might consider more of a stressor, but not necessarily a trauma. And then finally, the last two disorders listed here, other reactions to severe stress and reactions to severe stress unspecified, are these sort of catch-all, nonspecific, like somebody had a trauma or a stressor and they're experiencing some sort of symptoms, but they don't necessarily meet criteria for one of the other disorders that we have here, and so I'm going to give them this diagnostic code and be able to treat them, but, but they, typically maybe subsyndromal, perhaps don't have quite enough symptoms to meet criteria for PTSD or something like that. And actually, when I started this study, I thought those two groups would probably be the least interesting, and it turned out that they might be the most interesting, and I'll show you why when we look at the results in a minute. But we found some, some um, I think, informative things about people with those diagnoses. So the stress court, cohort, is residents of Denmark who received at least one stress disorder diagnosis at a psychiatric treatment facility between January 1, 1995 and December 31, 2011. 
and there's 111,844 of them. And we excluded people who received treatment for their stress disorder at a somatic treatment facility only. So these are people who never went to a psychiatrist or a psychologist for their stress disorder. And our initial feeling was that they were probably ideologically different somehow than people who were either severe enough to have ultimately decided to go the next step to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or different in some way. And given that our sample size without them was still over 111,000, we, we excluded them to start um, thinking that they might sort of represent something different. We also restricted the start of the study um, to 1995 onward. This was for a couple of reasons. The first is that ICD-10 was implemented in Denmark in 1994. And so because we were interested in capturing incident disorders here, new onset, and not just prevalent disorders, we wanted to give a period of time where people who had stress disorders but actually hadn't been diagnosed with them under the ICD-8 system, which came prior to ICD-10 in Denmark, um, could be re-diagnosed. So somebody perhaps who was being diagnosed with depression, let's say, but really had PTSD, once ICD-10 came into use in Denmark, they could be re-diagnosed with PTSD at that point, but they're really a prevalent case. They've had it for a long time, where we were interested in capturing new onset cases only. So it was one reason to restrict to 1995, giving that one-year period from 94 to 95 for prevalent cases to be re-diagnosed. The second reason was in 1994, 1995 in Denmark, outpatient uh, psychiatric and psychological treatment was added to the psychiatric registry. So prior to 1995, it had been inpatient treatment only. And given that a lot of these disorders are treated on an outpatient basis, it made sense to start the study when we knew we would be capturing inpatient and outpatient treatment together. So it was from 1995 onward. We then five to one matched a comparison cohort of also residents of Denmark who had never had a stress disorder diagnosis and they were matched on date of birth and gender. So a little bit more about the data sources for this study, a little more information about the registries. Um, the Danish Civil Registration System, as I mentioned earlier, began in 1968. It contains birth information, links between parents and children. You can link families, which is a really nice resource, for all residents of Denmark. Um, it contains vital statistics for each person, you know, if people emigrate from Denmark, kind of where everybody is. And it's updated daily. The psychiatric registry um, became computerized in 1969. As I said, it started including outpatient visits in 95. It contains treatment dates and up to 20 diagnoses per treatment entry. So somebody could be diagnosed with PTSD, depression, substance abuse, on, all on the same day. Um, there have been a ton of validation studies on the psychiatric data, all showing very high validity when compared to clinician reassessment or computer-based rediagnosis. Our own validation study showed high validity of the stress disorders, um, and this is where we got the stress disorder diagnoses. The National Patient Registry is sort of like the equivalent of the psychiatric registry, but for all somatic diagnoses, so any, any physical health diagnosis anybody's ever had. Um, and this would be treatment by non-psychiatrists and psychologists for anything. Um, and also includes treatment dates and 20 diagnoses per treatment entry. And then finally, because we were interested in all-cause mortality and suicide, we used the cause of death register, and that has information on detailed cause of death. Um, and also, there are um, certain inquests that happen with unnatural deaths, such as suicide, and so there's kind of a whole corroboration process that happens when they suspect a death is a suicide before it's finally coded as a suicide in the registries. So let me tell you a little bit about who's in the stress cohort now, after all that, that was a lot of lead up. So we ended up with 101,663 adults, 10,181 kids, and as you can see, adjustment disorder was the most commonly diagnosed stress disorder of the whole cohort, 65% of the adults in the cohort, 64% of the kids, followed by, and this was the first clue I had that something interesting was happening here, one of these unspecified diagnoses. Um, and then acute stress reaction and not much PTSD and not much other reactions to severe stress. And this is pretty consistent with the rest of Scandinavia where studies have found a low prevalence of PTSD. And actually some people say perhaps the U.S. is actually the outlier in the Western world with regard to the prevalence of PTSD being about 10% that we see here. Um, when we looked by gender, we saw very consistent with what we would see here in the U.S., which is that the cohort's about 60% women, even among children, women, female adults, female children, 60% across diagnoses. 
Um, 11% of the cohort received a second different stress diagnosis after their first diagnosis. So these would have been people that went from acute stress reaction to PTSD, things like that. Um, and in almost 91% of cases, the stress disorder was the primary diagnosis. So it was not people who had depression and a secondary PTSD. This was people that were being primarily diagnosed with the stress disorder. This is looking at the age of um, first diagnosis of stress disorder, and we see a huge jump in the early 20s, and then perhaps another little blip in the 30s, which is also consistent with what we see in other Western countries. And then finally, this is actually what I think is one of the more interesting things that came from this initial sort of descriptive work. This is the um, frequency of stress diagnoses by year of the cohort. So it's year of the cohort down here, 1995 to 2011 and just the number of diagnoses. And when we first ran this, we saw here that the number of every different di every diagnosis doubled in 2007 all of a sudden. And we had the biostatistician actually run this a bunch of times <laughs> because we didn't believe it was possible. Even down here, the scaling's a little weird, but those disorders were also doubling in occurrence at that point in time. And so we began to do a little digging about why this might have happened suddenly in 2007. And what we found out is a couple of things. First, the Danish government convened a congress of psychiatrists and psychologists in 2007, or 2006 actually, to talk about treating trauma and how to diagnose trauma and kind of highlighting trauma and post-trauma disorders as an issue. And so you really see here an example of the diagnosing went up because people became aware of trauma disorders. People doing the diagnosing became aware of them in a way they hadn't been previously. Also, um, some screening practices changed along with that. So it's really interesting because it's a nice example of how prevalence and incidence can change dramatically over time. The things that are really not related to etiology in any sort of meaningful way, just related to sort of diagnostic practices um, and other healthcare reasons um, that aren't related to the disorder per se. So now I'll talk a little bit about the outcomes we looked at after the cohort was established. Um, we looked at the first sort of pass at this we did was looking at psychiatric outcomes occurring after stress disorder. Um, nobody had really looked at that in this long of a time period before, like how, how much comorbidity happens after a stress disorder di diagnosis. And is it that depression is coming after PTSD or is it that people who are depressed are more likely to get PTSD? We sort of looked at that a bit. Um, and we looked at, as I said, suicide and all-cause mortality as outcomes using proportional hazards regression. And those analyses were adjusted for depression, anxiety disorder, substance abuse, and Charleston comorbidity index, which is an index of, I think, 22 um, physical health diagnoses somebody might have. So you basically get a one for each diagnosis you have, and then you get an overall score. The analyses were restricted to adults. Um, and one other thing I'll mention, and you'll see why in a minute, is that we excluded suicide from the all-cause mortality analyses. So those are all-cause mortality for anything other than suicide. So when we looked at potentially traumatic experiencing following stress disorders, and I'm sorry, the scaling is a little weird on that side. Basically, the take-home message from this is that it seems that for any disorder, any stress disorder you have, you're more likely to experience an event that's potentially traumatic after you already have the stress disorder diagnosis. And re-traumatization like this is something people talk about in the literature all the time, but it had never been really documented over this long of a period of time before on this scale. And the same thing was true for comorbid disorders. No matter which stress disorder you had, even these nonspecific ones, you're more likely to be diagnosed with a comorbid second psychiatric disorder after your stress disorder. You see down here this green line is, sorry, I should have mentioned this, people in the general population over the same period of time. And the other lines are the stress disorder diagnosed cohort. So comorbidity is more likely to occur among people with a stress disorder than in the general population over the same time period. And here are the all-cause mortality and suicide results. So um, it's, I'll just highlight here the boxes showing the adjusted all-cause mortality hazard ratio and the adjusted suicide hazard ratio. And across the top, you see the different stress disorders. And what you see is that basically, no matter which stress disorder you have, you have about double the risk of mortality than people in the general population over the same time period. 
And the reason we excluded suicide from this all-cause mortality analysis is because there is a gigantic difference between people with stress disorders and the comparison group with regard to the rate of suicide over the same time period. So you're much more likely to die by suicide with a stress disorder. So we were a little bit concerned that these huge suicide rates were influencing the all-cause mortality rate, which is why we took it out to begin with. Um, but it goes to show that all of the stress disorders really have long-term detrimental consequences. And one thing I think is particularly interesting with regard to the nonspecific stress disorders is that, you know, it's a little bit consistent with the RDOC initiative. I'm not sure how much, how many of you know about that, NIMH's initiative to move away from diagnoses and study more constructs and subsyndromal potentially um, um, disorders. Because we see here that even people with the unspecified diagnoses have just as bad of outcomes as people with PTSD and with other disorders that we might consider more severe. So people with the unspecified stress disorders double the risk of all-cause mortality, just like people with PTSD have, and a high risk of suicide, just like people with PTSD have. So um, I thought that this result was particularly interesting because it lends a little evidence to the RDOC initiative that we perhaps should be moving away from classic diagnostic criteria and looking a little bit more across levels of severity, and that might have actually higher public health impact given that more people tend to fall in these subsyndromal categories than in full diagnostic criteria categories. So then we moved on. That was sort of the initial grant. And then we moved on very kindly through some funding of the chair of the department there to start looking at physical health outcomes of stress disorders. Um, and the first that we looked at was PTSD and cancer. So that stress and cancer has been discussed in the literature for decades and decades and decades. Um, and we thought this is a chance for us to look at PTSD as a marker for severe stress across different types of cancer in one sample. A lot of the studies that have looked at this have looked at either a specific type of stress, like just work stress, and a specific type of cancer, like just breast cancer. And this would give us kind of a chance to look across um, a variety of different types of cancer. So for these analyses, we looked at the observed number of cancer cases one year after PTSD diagnosis and compared it to the expected number of cancer cases in the underlying population. So we did an SMR type analysis. And we didn't present any results where there were um, fewer than five observed incident cancers in the time period. And we found really nothing. <laughs> when I present this slide, I always say, you really pretty much don't get more null than an association of 1.0 with a confidence interval of 0.88 to 1.2. We found really no evidence of an association between PTSD and cancer at all. Um, and you can look down across the different types of cancer we were able to observe. Colon cancer, I mean, it looks like there may be some evidence of an effect there, but it's based on the minimum number of cases we were willing to include, just five. So I, you know, would not make anything of that, and I didn't make any of that in this paper. Um, so we really found no evidence. And we did a bunch of stratified analysis of this. We looked across gender and age groups and all kinds of um, time to diagnosis, all kinds of things, and really found no evidence of associations anywhere. The next um, thing we looked at was PTSD and cardiovascular disease, which has been studied a ton in the literature. And a lot of the studies on this uh, are among male U.S. veterans. Um, but there are fewer, at the time that this was done, there were fewer studies of gender differences, actually, fewer studies that looked at females specifically to see if what we find among women is the same as what we know among men. Um, and also, no work really on other stress disorders. It's interesting because there's been some debate in this literature about whether or not it's actually trauma that increases your risk of cardiovascular disease, trauma in and of itself, or is it PTSD, or is it both? And so one interesting thing I thought we could do with this data is we could look at other stress disorders where trauma is not necessarily part of the experience. And if we find an association there also, that gives us some evidence that it's actually the stress disorder contributing to the cardiovascular disease, not just necessarily the traumatic experience itself. So we looked at PTSD in four different cardiovascular disease events in Denmark, and you can see we found associations about 1.5 to 2, and really very little evidence of gender differences. And since the time that this paper was published, this has been pretty consistent with some other, what some other people have found in U.S. samples. And when we looked by, at adjustment disorder, very similar, strikingly similar effects. Um, to what we found for PTSD. So it seems like consistently across stress disorders, whether or not trauma per se is a criteria for diagnosis, there seems to be this effect on cardiovascular disease events. 
um, that is consistent and also very limited and evidence of gender differences here across the different cardiovascular disease events. And then finally, the last um, thing I'll present from this cohort is we did some work on PTSD and gastrointestinal disorders. This has also been the subject of a lot of research, but there is some discrepancy. There's a lot of discrepancy, actually, in the literature on this. Some studies finding evidence of an effect, other studies finding none. A recent meta-analysis suggested that it was maybe due to methodological differences between studies. So again, we thought, you know, we have a chance here to look at PTSD and individual gastrointestinal disorders, because our sample is big enough to do that, and see what might be causing this discrepancy and if it can be uh, attributed to methodological differences. And one of the things that was highlighted specifically is that many previous studies group gastrointestinal disorders into one overall category, but they vary. Um, so perhaps that grouping explains it. And sure enough, we found results that are consistent with that. So for all gastrointestinal disorders, it looks like there's about 1.8 um, times the risk of, of gastrointestinal disorders if you have PTSD. But then if you look across the type of gastrointestinal disorder going down the list, you see the effects vary sort of widely. Um, for peptic ulcer, we find a three times the risk, but for diverticular of the intestines, we find no increase in risk. And so it kind of lends evidence to this idea that actually perhaps what explains the discrepancies in the literature to date is that previous studies are grouping these gastrointestinal disorders all together, and when you do that, the effect you're observing is going to be consistent with whichever group of these is the biggest. So if you happen to get a GI group that has a lot of peptic ulcer, you'll observe an effect probably that's around three. But if you happen to get a GI overall group that has a lot of diverticular of the intestines, you may observe no effect. So, um, so this paper sort of was a call to look at gastrointestinal disorders separately going forward in that line of work. So, so that was sort of a summary of where I was about 18 months ago with my Danish research, um, really working on this, this stress cohort and sort of starting to think through what could be done with that resource next um, after the grant ended. And so that's led to a trauma cohort R01 that I'll be talking about now and a suicide prediction R01 that's a little bit separate, but I'll talk about that second. So as I was kind of moving forward in time thinking about the stress disorder cohort and where I could go with it next, I of course was thinking about sort of challenges we face in the field of stress disorder research and, wh and what those exactly were and what could be done about them. So for anyone who doesn't know, trauma is very common. Many, many people, majority of people will experience a trauma in their life, but most people don't develop psychopathology following trauma. Most people recover. And exactly why that is, remains an open question. And so some of the things that I think are related to that that I've been thinking about at this time were, first of all, obtaining prospective data on risk factors for psychopathology following trauma. So trauma is, an off, is often an unexpected occurrence. There are very few studies that have prospective data collected on somebody's life prior to a trauma and then their life after a trauma. And of course, once a trauma happens, people's reporting changes. And a lot of studies rely on that sort of retrospective reporting for people to talk about their life before the trauma happened, which they may be remembering in a very positive way at that point. Um, they might not be reporting accurately. So, so I think one of the challenges to the field of trauma that I hope this project addresses is that we there's really a limited opportunity to get prospective data on somebody's life pre-trauma. The other challenge for anybody in here that might do any work in this area or, you know, in psychiatry in general that you'll know is that there's lots of debate in the field right now about what psychopathology following trauma even is. There's lots of debate in psychiatry right now about diagnoses in general. And I mentioned RDoc earlier, you know, this is related to that. It's sort of related to the idea that we don't do a great job classifying psychopathology. And, you know, NIH, I think, is committed to people doing better at that. Um, but there are some studies that show that PTSD and depression have, like, 70 percent comorbidity. So if we are really, if, the, if, if they really have that high of a level of comorbidity, are we really talking about two separate disorders at all anymore? Or is that one other disorder that we've not done a good job of capturing that's a combined PTSD and depression diagnosis? So, that, so that's something that was sort of a gap in the field. 
And then the last thing I was thinking about at this time was that I was really moving more into the area of machine learning and this idea that the way we model associations traditionally really doesn't capture the complexity of how associations occur in real life. And I'll talk about this a little bit more with the suicide study specifically, but you know, many people who have psychopathology have, you know, experienced traumatic events, have lots of things happening in their life that contribute to these outcomes occurring. And then we take them and sort of put them in our regression model simplistically and, you know, estimate an association as though these things occur in isolation and they don't. So I had sort of been thinking through this idea that we really should be using different statistical modeling if we want to start making any headway on some of these questions. So. At the same time, there was a comment about the original study that was rattling around in my head, and this came up throughout the whole thing, which is basically that you know people have stress disorder diagnoses, but you don't know what happened to them. What really would be the more interesting thing is if you knew what they experienced, what trauma led to the stress disorder diagnosis. And I thought, of course, that would be more interesting. And we did in our outcomes paper look a little bit at the proportion of people who experienced different events that we could get from the registry, so accidents, and of course, we saw that people with the stress disorder diagnosis experienced a greater frequency of all of these events than people in the comparison cohort. So we had some sense that we would be able to get some data on potential traumas from the registries through this like very simple sort of basic analysis we did. And so we sat down and we tried to think through ways that we could get at trauma data from the registries with the ultimate goal of making the stress disorder cohort really a trauma cohort, like going a step back in time and trying to characterize what actually happened to these people and having that be the starting point instead of at the time of diagnosis. So we figured out ways to get at 10 different traumatic events, some through the registries, some through collaborations I had to forge with other people in Denmark. Um, but we can link families and get sudden immediate death of family members or children. Um, we can get pregnancy-related trauma from a birth registry. We can get life-threatening illness or injury. We have a sexual assault registry. Um, and so there are different types of assault and accidents that will be coded in the registries. So as I said, the idea is that we will redefine the original stress cohort based on trauma exposure. And we think based on the number of people that had the few things we were able to look at so far, we'll have a trauma cohort of about 70,000 people with the idea that some of them will then go forward in time and get stress disorder diagnosis, and that's how they ended up in our original cohort, and some of them will be from our comparison group. They'll go forward in time and never get a stress disorder diagnosis, and that's sort of how we'll define recovery from the trauma. So what we'll do for this project, hopefully, <laughs> ultimately, is um, use latent class analysis to identify common post-trauma presentations of multidimensional psychopathology or transdiagnostic psychopathology. So for this project, I'm really not interested in the outcomes being just PTSD or just depression or just substance abuse. I want to use latent class analysis to figure out how these things are grouping together on the population level and have those be our outcomes. So I'm guessing we'll have some highly comorbid PTSD, depression, substance abuse group. We'll probably have some groups with one or two comorbidities or single disorders, and then we'll have this recovered group um, from our comparison cohort. And we're also going to look at changes in those outcome class memberships over time using latent transition analysis. So who goes from a single disorder to being highly comorbid, diagnosed with lots of different disorders over time, and vice versa. And then we'll use machine learning to develop predictive models of these classes. So using pre-trauma data, trauma treatment data, data about people's life after the trauma, what of that predicts who gets into these different psychopathology classes over time, and what can obviously we learn from that to inform um, recovery. And then we are going to look at different models by gender and type of trauma. So that project just was funded three months ago, so it's in the very early stages, sort of, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's in the very early stages of sort of me getting it up and running. Um, maybe I can come back in a few years and present some results. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit now about the final project uh, that I'm working on right now, which is this prediction of suicidal behavior project. So this was kind of all sort of happening at the same time, um, but we all know probably anyone in this room who's involved in psychiatry at all knows suicide is a significant public health priority. And there's like a huge literature on suicide, on risk factors for suicide. It's been decades long this has been happening, and yet we're not good at predicting suicide. Those clinicians are... 50-50 chance of predicting suicide in any one patient. Um, so, and there are lots of reasons for that. 
Um, one reason is that, you know, depression is one of the strongest predictors anybody knows about this field knows of, but lots of people have depression and very few of them actually go on to make a suicide attempt or die by suicide. So the predictors that we know of that are strongly associated or the variables we know of that are strongly associated with suicide actually are poor predictors in a clinical setting. They don't do a good job of prediction. And it was at this time that I was also kind of thinking through more of this, what have we done in traditional statistics that has not really served us well with regard to this issue. And this is really, even though I presented these studies sort of out of order, this is really where I sort of honed my thinking about this. Um, but I kind of had the idea that, you know, patients don't walk into a clinician's office with one problem and then go on to die by suicide. And yet, statistically, we model these things as though, you know, one thing is happening and maybe we adjust for a few or maybe we look at a few mediators and moderators, but really we're not capturing the full complex clinical picture of somebody that goes on to die by suicide. Um, so I started thinking more about the limits of traditional regression and sort of the benefits of machine learning. Limits of traditional regression, it requires an investigator to specify predictors. So if I'm doing a suicide study and I want to run a regression about what might predict suicide in my sample, I decide, okay, PTSD, I'll put in and I'll put in depression and I put in all the things everybody's been putting in for a long time now, but that hasn't really gotten us that far. We're still not good at predicting it clinically. So I, so I was kind of thinking of that as a limitation and with machine learning actually you're able to put all the predictors that you have data on in and let the models tell you what the most important predictors are. So it kind of gets you perhaps down the road of observing some novel things. Um, again, there's this inability to model complex risk, risk profiles with traditional regression and we know people who are going to die by suicide or even have psychopathology for that matter usually have complex risk profiles. And so there's this disconnect with clinical presentation. So right around the same time NIMH produced this report, National Institute of Mental Health, basically saying we need somebody to develop risk algorithms from healthcare data that can be used for suicide risk detection. And I was like, I can do that. <laughs> I've become interested in this. And it said overcome base rate challenges and response bias by identifying innovative biostatistical and other methods. Um, I think somewhere in here we also mentioned something about using data from a full population. And so it was sort of this beautiful marriage of like this interest that I was developing in machine learning and what it could be used to predict suicide with NIMH basically saying like, we need, and I had access to the Danish data, which is a full population. So it kind of all came together nicely. So the idea for the Suicide R01 is that we're going to look at the immediate and long-term risk factors and develop suicide risk models of suicidal ideation, attempt, and death. Um, we'll, we'll develop risk algorithms for specific subgroups. I think this is one of the nice things we can do because of the size of the sample. Um, we can take just people with depression and develop risk models among them. We can take just people with cancer and develop risk models among them. We know now, because this study is a little further along, that from 1995 to 2015, we have about 15,000 suicide deaths that we'll be looking at. Um, so we'll do a lot of specific sort of subgroup analyses that are important to specific populations. And then um, we were going to use regression-based analyses to sort of quantify the effects we find in the machine learning. So in conclusion, epidemiology of stress, trauma, and suicidal behavior in Denmark is generally consistent with um, what's been found in the U.S. I love talking about generalizability in this case, though, so I'm happy to discuss that. Um, these exploratory R01 studies that I have funded now hope to capitalize on this resource and advance what we know about psychopathology and suicide. And I'd love to collaborate. I will have like a ton of data <laughs> from these R1s, so I'd be thrilled to collaborate with anybody that's interested. And Tom can vouch that I'm a good collaborator. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Actually, the curve shows that it was increasing before the conference. So I think the, the figure also shows that, you know, I, I guess the, the primary care or whoever is doing the diagnostic also had an influence on this diagnostic on the policy makers. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Particularly in the, in the acute stress reaction, you, you see an increase in suicide. Yeah, it's interesting. And it may also be reflective of, you know, 
the, so Denmark went from ICD-8 to ICD-10. And in ICD-8, there were nothing like stress disorders like there were in ICD-10. So it could also just be reflective of some of what we tried to avoid, which was re-diagnosis of people that really had it before um, and capturing incident cases. It may just be that with the implementation of ICD-10, over time we're observing a general increase in the use of those diagnoses as clinicians sort of became more comfortable with them in general. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I all fascinating. Um, I was curious where, when you were predicting um, cardiovascular disease and the uh, death with diseases, mm -hmm. how different are the findings that you have from what the literature would suggest? Very con So for, for cardiovascular disease, very consistent with what's been found, very consistent with what's been found in the U.S. The gastrointestinal disease is a little bit trickier because that literature is very mixed, yeah. I think, owing to some of the fact that there are these combined categories of gastrointestinal diseases people use. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are some studies that have demonstrated an effect comparable to the, what we found for some of the disorders. And then there are some studies that have found no effect, which we also found for some of the individual disorders. So I think... So uh, there has been no study that's looked at the individual ones sort of to that scale that we have. So, th so that is consistent and inconsistent. I think we looked at it a little bit differently, which leads to the inconsistency. But um, across combined groups of gastrointestinal disorders, there have been lots of variability in what's been found. But the cardiovascular disease is very consistent with the U.S. And, and one, just one follow-up. Yeah. Had anyone broken it down by the type of stress? No. Mm -mm. So that was yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. In your first study with the suicide, I got the impression that you're looking at suicide death and suicide We're doing both. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, it's pretty broad, but yeah, and actually I've had to, for responses on grants before, look into really more the issue of selection bias. So, you know, because it is a healthcare system and because I'm studying things that pe typically lead people to avoid seeking care, like trauma and PTSD right, yeah. that people may not want to talk about, you know, I've faced the criticism of like, well, does everybody access the system? And pretty much they do. There are publicly available data from Denmark that show that pretty much everybody in the population will at least make some contact with the healthcare system in a given year. Now that may not be going for full treatment for whatever you have, but it's some contact that at least you could assume if they were very severely mentally ill or struggling with something, you know, whatever provider they were seeing would pick up on it and try to get them into appropriate services. Mm -hmm. The health factors are mm -hmm. always there, but mm -hmm. they just hadn't been sort of coordinating with the doctors. Do you see that? It's funny. I think actually the opposite might be true. So we were talking a little bit about this this morning, that in the, in the VA, where I also do a bunch of research, we saw about five or six years ago this huge increase in the incidence of PTSD among Vietnam veterans which, you know, Vietnam now was a long time ago, and why suddenly would Vietnam veterans be getting PTSD now? But really what it was was that they were starting to have aging into having physical health problems that were bringing them to the VA. And once you come to the VA, you get screened for PTSD. And it turns out they had PTSD for the last however many decades, but were abusing substances or using substances to cope with it. So I actually think if it happens anyway, it probably happens the other way. People don't go to talk about their trauma. They, go, they try to avoid their trauma, but they go for something else and their trauma gets discovered. Did you 
Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't looked at that. That's a good, interesting question, though. Yeah, to see what other diagnoses are happening on the same day, like what brought them. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yes, we're working on that right now. It's actually so tricky. <laughs> so it turns out you don't just put every variable you have into the machine learning model. There are too many of them in a situation like this. And so you go through sort of a whole data reduction process, which is actually the point of that project that we're on right now. So um, there are many ways to go about it. And we're kind of actually right now talking through the different possibilities, um, you know, and it will likely be a multi-pronged approach of all of these ways. Um, empirically, any variable, any predictor that doesn't have a lot of observations, you can sort of kick out right away. You know, they're not going to be that informative. Um, luckily for me, in this particular project, their Army STARS study, which I don't know how many, it was a big suicide machine learning study in the Army, has actually laid a lot of groundwork of how they um, sort of, um, you know, decrease their data, their predictor data, to get to a set of things they wanted to start with. But we're sort of talking that all through now. So we could, you know, run certain, and we've talked about principal components analysis and running all these different things that may get us to some version of pared down data. We've talked about doing it just simply as ICD category, starting there and seeing then maybe what we want to look into a little more specifically. So I think there are lots of ways to go about it and probably the ultimate version will be some combination of all of those and likely differs project to project, I would guess. I just find the data set so, so fascinating. I'm sitting here thinking about your, your, um, your party last week, mm -hmm. and it just the richness where you can go, um, you can follow what happened to them, mm -hmm. um, how they were treated, that sort of thing. Are you thinking about modeling? Yeah, I mean, I, so that's not something I've thought of yet. I mean, it's, there's so much that could be done, you know, that you sort of get to a point where you're like, <laughs> you feel like you have to make a very long list. Um, but yeah, that would be something, and, and again, if that's something that interested somebody else, I would be thrilled to have them do that with this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think your idea of going back, mm -hmm. actually, don't, it's, going, it's a psychiatric, let's go back before the diagnosis and pick up the advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've been lucky. I got creative. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, those unspecified stress disorders, I spend a bunch of time trying to figure out who those people are, you know, because I'm not in Denmark and I don't know who gets diagnosed with that. And I mean, really the sort of anecdotal and talking with clinicians answer I typically received is that they're people with subsyndromal stress disorders. They're people that have some of the symptoms of PTSD, experience trauma, but don't meet full criteria for PTSD or maybe would meet it according to the DSM, which has a shorter period of time for symptoms to need to be present, but ICD has a longer period of time. And so it's three months after the trauma. That's not long enough for ICD to call that PTSD, but they need help now. Um, so, so, I, so again, for the RDOC initiative and this whole sort of let's get away from looking at strict diagnostic criteria, I think that's sort of an interesting piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask a question. When you're talking about the sort of failure of traditional modeling to predict suicide, do you have a way to know whether it's a failure of the modeling or a failure of the deterministic nature of the baseline characteristics? Like it's just chaotic and can't be predicted, or it's just I think my personal belief about it is that I think that we have, the models are able to tell us things that are very strongly associated with an outcome, but in groups of people where there are many people with that predictor, but few, but, but now we're dealing with a rare outcome, but a few will engage in this behavior, it, knowing that the association is strong doesn't really help us there. And so the, that is the piece where I think the complex risk profiles comes in, that among these even what we would call high-risk people, what do we need, what else do we need to know? And I think the way to get at that is something that is perhaps more data-driven, like this, where I'm not specifying what else we need to know, because I will specify the things we've been looking at this whole time, but we're letting the model sort of tell us what, it, what there is to know. Like it's partially supervised, mm -hmm. you're not doing deep learning, totally No. Yeah, it's, yes. How did you decide to do that? Is it computational or rather than just let it run free? So to be perfectly honest, the machine learning people I collaborate with have expertise in this area. <laughs> I mean, that really is, you know, and we've talked about doing sort of other sophisticated stuff in the next project, you know, but, but this is sort of what we went with first. <laughs> and so to sort of look at, I mean, I, you know, the basic research, of course, you should look at each individual baby's contribution, but I think where science, you know, where I think it should go is looking at these clusters of risks or behaviors that you put out some instead of a single mm -hmm. cause and effect. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> So we need to yield the room to the next group, but I want to thank everybody. For thank you so much, everyone. And uh, thank you, Dr. Bradley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.